All right. Everybody ready? Let's get this show on the road. Hi, everybody. If you are joining us for the fourth evening with Artifacts and you've been here before, hello. Nice to see you again. And if you're new, I'm Ellen Goodwin, co-founder of Artifacts, and I have Heather here, who is our CEO and co-founder. Heather, you want to say hi? Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to hear all about Rodney and his adventures all over the world. And on that note, hi, Rodney. Hello. How are y'all doing? Great. We're happy to have you join us. And everyone, you know, happy I don't to be know here. <laughs> I don't know if you've had a chance to uh, read Rodney's bio ahead of this uh, evening, but it's entertaining and maybe thrilling all at once. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor because we told you he's a photographer, which is absolutely true. But in his bio, he talks about, I wrote a screenplay, moved to LA twice, played basketball with Kevin Costner, saved a dog in Pearl Harbor, rigged lights for music videos, climbed the top of the Astrodrome, published a magazine, lived in a 150 square foot tiny house he built, moved to a 900 square foot palatial estate and more. <laughs> so I think you get an idea for the adventure that is uh, his spirit. And tonight we're gonna talk about his photo photography career, where he started, where he is now and where he's going. Cause there's a lot to unpack there and a lot of great stories. Rodney and I actually met about a year ago right after we launched Artifacts and he lives about an hour southeast of southwest, excuse me, of me in a in a small city in Texas called Wimberley. And I'm up in Austin. So we've gotten to know each other. We're connected over Africa, which I'm sure we're gonna touch that continent tonight. And so with no further ado, let's hop into it. So Rodney, I wanted to kind of start off with, you know, that bio is exciting, but it doesn't actually tell people how you got into photography to start with. Can you roll back time and, and give us a little inkling of how you got started? Yeah, uh, on yeah, my bio, most of it's true, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, wait, now we have to do the, one of those uh, child games. I, <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, my, my dad was a scuba instructor and I... I I make the joke that I was, you know, some people are born with a silver spoon in their mouth and I was born with a regulator in my mouth. <laughs> and um, yeah, so growing up, we always had a bunch of strangers in our backyard, you know, doing, you know, taking scuba lessons. And so there was always a scuba tank on the side. And my dad, his, um, he did underwater photography just as a hobby. And that's where I learned was underwater when I was, I don't know, 10 or 12 years old back with the old Nikonis cameras and when you had to roll a 24 film and you go down and you had to compose every single shot because it's not like now with digital where you could just you know shoot 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 you know you had to be really you know focused and but um and I and I think you know that's like most photographers that started you know with film I think that's what makes a lot of great photographers because they're you know having to, to, you know, really pay attention. And, you know, unlike now where you can just, I call it spray and pray, you know, you just go and shoot a bunch and hope you get something good out of it. But he, uh, even with the technology to shoot 5,000 pictures in a day, I still, I'm still pretty, you know, cautious and I try not to, you know, overdo it. Cause I, you know, I don't, I don't want to go through 5,000 photos either. So. Yeah, that's tedious. But, Do you yeah. still have any of your original cameras? My dad still has them. Yeah. So, yeah. In fact, I've got, uh, I got to turn the AC down just a second. It's really hot. Okay, one thing. But um, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. So, yeah, in fact, I've still got my, um, why isn't that working? Just for everyone to understand. It's still a hundred degrees here in Texas. It hasn't yeah. gotten the memo that it's fall. So you can even tell Heather and I tonight, I'm dressed for summer, she's dressed for winter and poor Rodney's melting in his foot. <laughs> yeah, I came up to my studio, which I'm not here all the time. So the AC wasn't on and it's hot in here. But um, so yeah, we've still, he's still got, in fact, I was thinking about that the other day, I wanted to go and grab all that and just, see see what i could do with it you know, you know just it might be fun but and and i've still i've still got one of my very first photos that i took 
that what my dad it? It, it it's not a great photo doesn't but matter it's, but it's just you know it's 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 a sponge it's a sea sponge and the fish isn't even facing you know he's swimming away and but my my dad printed that for me and had it framed and gave it to me years ago and i've it's in here somewhere like i said it's it's not a a great photo but you know i have to say it that's a great artifact you can artifact yeah and tell yeah story. yeah so and i you know and i'm i'm working on a book in my head right now i haven't started putting it together but it's going to be a collection of you know my stories and every with each photo and so i i do want to put that in there to kind of you know launch it and talk about you know wow. how i how i got started so you cut your teeth in the water which isn't a really uh easy environment to get started in so when you when you got older what was your first subject for photography did you specialize right away no it was um my when when i started like I said, my dad had a scoop of business and he ran ran trips all over the world and the main one was the cayman islands he would after his scuba trips, he would run trips down there for his new new divers. And so my summers I spent there, you know, several, several weeks every summer. And the, you know, came a dive and it's, you know, it's Caribbean diving, it's just reef, it's fish, it's, you know, nothing overly exciting. You know, occasionally you'll see a nurse shark, or you know, if you go out on the walls, you know, you'll you might run into a hammerhead or something, but there's, you know, there's no great whites, there's no whales, there's, you know, it's just, and I, I think I just got kind of bored with it. And my, when I, I guess it was around high school, my dad sold his business and we all just kind of got out of it. He quit diving, so I quit diving. And it was, it was probably 15 or 20 years that I, that I wasn't diving. But, um, and, photography was never my intention it was just it was always a hobby it was just something I just loved to do I just loved taking pictures and it never it didn't make any sense it was this isn't a career you know I, I didn't want to you know be a wedding photographer or portrait photographer you know that kind of thing and so yeah I just always just kind of dabbled with it and it was later on that friends started noticing and commenting and say, you know, you need to pursue this. And I kept hearing it over and over and living in the Austin area, I've got a bunch of friends in the music business. So I just started doing, you know, music portraits for friends and they knew somebody and then they knew somebody and then they knew somebody and somehow down the road, I'm hanging out with ZZ Top and Willie Nelson and Lyle Lovett and you know, <laughs> shooting all these guys. And I, I have, I have no idea how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been great. Did you go to them? Did you go on the road, meet them where they were at? How did that come to be? My music stuff is all Austin. I occasionally I'll I'll travel. Um, I guess we'll we'll get to that story in a minute. But you know my experiences with Donovan Frankenrider. Yeah. He. Um, I guess I was going to tell it, but yeah. He. Um, it's a surfer and, you know, he retired from surfing and is now a touring musician. And I discovered his music before I knew him as a surfer. And he played at ACL several years ago, nine years ago, something like that. And I got a photo pass through a magazine that I was shooting for with the sole purpose of I was shooting for them, but I would, I went, you know, I wanted to go and try and track him down. And he was on the main stage, one of the main stages. And I was like, ah, I'm never going to get to this guy. And then um, I was looking at the schedule and they've got that. There's it's the kitty stage where different artists will go and play you know, this, this stage back in the very back where the kids can go and listen to music and hang out. And as, so I was like, well, I just, you know, maybe I'll go over there and see if I can, you know, get to him. And he was playing and there were maybe 50 people there. So I went up and talked to him and he was doing these surf with the camp or surf with the pro surf camps through Bill Vong. And I had asked him, you know, if I, if I could go on this and shoot it and I've, you know, I've never shot surf photography in my life and they, they hadn't scheduled it yet, but he said, just, you know, follow my stuff. And then when this, you know, when we announce it, you know, 
get in touch and I'll, you know, we'll see what we can do. And so long story short, I called Billabong when it finally came around and they'd already had a photographer and videographer that they were taking where they said, you know, if you want to go as a camp or, you know, as a camper and shoot it, you're more than welcome. But of course I had to pay and it was in Indonesia and it ended up being about a seven or $8,000 trip. And I was like, I, I had to do this. So I, I stuck it on a credit card and right before I left, my grandmother had, she came over for dinner and uh, she's like, oh yeah, I've been wanting to tell you that I just, I wanted to, I wanted to give you your inheritance now because I don't want every, all my you know grandkids waiting for me to die to get my money. <laughs> I, was just, I was like, all right, well, thank you. So she gave me a check for 5,000 bucks and then I go over there and, well, and I'm doing research on, you know, surf housings and how to do surf photography. And I said, didn't have a clue what I was doing. And we got back and I sent the photos to Donovan and he's sending out to all his sponsors and Billabong and Martin Guitar and Snuck Shoes and all these guys were buying my photos. And I actually ended up making money on this trip. And I didn't, you know, like I said, didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> But, wow that's victory that's yeah, victory and it's so, karma it, yeah and but it was yeah it was through that that um you know donovan and i became really good friends and i've you know gone on a couple tours with him and then of course you know when he comes through austin i'll go and shoot or you know i'll go out to la every once in a while and you know do a shoot for him but yeah but it was it was that i i got back from that trip and I'm looking at my photos and I just, I, I had the most, I, I don't know what it was, but I just, I had to get back in the water and I got, it, it got me thinking about, you know, my scuba stuff. And I was like, well, hell, I've got all this stuff now. And I, I put out a, yeah, I just, I, 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 and I don't know where this came from. I don't even remember, but I just, I put out a feeler. And I was, I was wanting to find out where I could go photograph sharks. And I think I just put a post on Facebook and this girl that I had, I don't know if we were already, probably, no, a, a, another friend of, uh, she connected me with this girl and she reached out and was, she had done the great whites in Guadalupe. And so I think it was, you know, two months later, I'm on a boat heading out to, Guadalupe to go photograph great whites and that that was the launch of my you know my underwater and yeah now now I'm hooked you know it just it was all those years of photo you know photographing reef fish and got bored and so now it's I'm photographing the things that can kill me or eat me so, <laughs> so that's more dangerous than rock stars I suppose I don't know <laughs> <laughs> in his bio everyone he talks about these dangerous animals and and he throws in the musicians and he said only one of them is dangerous and so i was actually curious yeah. which one you consider dangerous <laughs> oh yeah the yeah, other musicians i'd rather be in the water with a great wife than a musician <laughs> <laughs> okay that's a story for another day yeah <laughs> So when I met you, we connected through Africa. So somehow you got out of the water and onto the giant continent that is Africa. So what mm -hmm. happened there? Tell us that. And then we want to, when we want to share a few particular photos with folks and tell the stories behind a few of them. Okay. Yeah. The, um, Africa was just, I mean, every, I think that's every photographer wants, that's the, I think that's the, the, the main that's, the what what am I trying to say? You know the the you know, the goal of all photographers and but it just you know it's it's not a it's not a cheap trip you know if you're doing it on your you know on your own dime and I it, it was I guess the first time I went was it was about three years ago and there was just it was just a time in my life for about a year because I normally I'm traveling about every you know two months or so before you know before the situation that we're in and you know now but I, I was always gone always doing something but the trips that I was doing were you know three four thousand dollar trips and Africa is you know if you it's a, you know it's a twenty thousand dollar expense and 
there was about a year where I wasn't traveling. And so I inadvertently saved up some money and a buddy of mine, he had reached out and he was wanting to go. He said, well, let's, you know, let's, let's go to Africa. And we, our first schedule, we, it was about a, about a two week trip. And we kept on all the research that we're doing, mostly him. I'm just kind of the, let's, I'll just show up and get there and go shoot. And, you know, this buddy of mine, he just plans, 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 plans. But he kept finding all these things. He was like, we need to do this. We need to do this. We need to do this. So this two-week trip turns into a five-week trip. (laughs) But we, yeah, we went through, we flew into Tanzania, did the entire Serengeti. We flew up, you know, to the north, and then we had a we had a guide that we'd hired that drove us down the entire Serengeti. That was a uh, eight days. And then we flew over to um, Kenya and did, um, you know, it's where I guess you know we we can get into Crag the elephants and yes. and that was that was the main thing that I wanted to see. You know, I just I, it, that was that was my goal. And then after Tanzania. We went over to Ethiopia and did the Omo Valley with the tribe. Just one of the most remote, you know, village. They're not village. It's a, you know, it's an area. There's several villages there, but there's about nine different tribes over there. And, you know, we did, you know, 10 days, 10 days over there. But, and, and now in the last three years, I've been three times now. So I'm just, I'm, I'm addicted. It's, I was say, it's an addiction now. So yeah. let's talk about a couple of those photos. Heather's ready to pop them into chat. Do you want to do one of Craig? Talk about Craig? Yeah, we can talk about Craig. That was it's kind of a it's a sad story. Not I not all of it, but it was when I when I got over there, I, I wasn't familiar. There was it was Tim and Craig. There because of the, the big Tuskers, there's only about two dozen left on the planet. And I, I wasn't familiar with all the, you know, the, the names of them and who was who. I didn't even know that was a thing at first. And I got over there and I learned about Tim and Craig who were in um, Amboseli, which is now one of my favorite places because it's mostly elephants. It's, and I love the big open fields, the, you know, the dust and the dirt. And it just, it, it's just, it's my, my perfect dream spot for you know for my subjects but yeah we we went up we got we got to our first camp and I had heard about Tim and Craig and I asked our guide there and he said yeah we can you know we can probably find them and we found we found Craig the first day and then um they they didn't know where Tim was sometimes they hang out together sometimes they don't and you know, they'll roam in and out of the parks and they'll go into areas that aren't accessible. And, but we, we had gotten back to camp that night and it was about, I guess it was about four, four thirty, and they had spotted him, but it was about an hour away. Mm-hmm. And if we had left right then, we would have had maybe five minutes of light with him. So I, I asked, I asked the guy, you know, what are, you know, how, how, how much do these guys roam? You know, what, is there a chance that he'll be there in the morning? You know, can we just get up super early? And he said, more than likely, you know, it's, they don't, you know, he won't roam too far. So we got up at, I think about four in the morning and we drove. And just as the sun's coming up, we got to this area where he was and he had just left and gone into a part that we couldn't access. And oh, a couple of days later, you know, we were, we were, um, you know, so with that, like I said, the, the two more, the two other days that we were there was dedicated to trying to find him, but it mm-hmm. never happened. And then we left and went to another camp. And I told him, I said, if you spot him, call me and I'll figure out how to get on a puddle jumper or something yeah. and fly back up here. That never happened. And it was a few months after I got home, I woke up. And I'd gotten a message that they had found Tim and he had passed away. Fortunately, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't um, poachers. poachers or, you know, whatever, you know, the, you know, the wildlife, con- human wildlife conflict, which is just as bad, if not worse than poaching now. Yeah. But um, that time when we were there, the, the rains were so heavy and the grasses were just super thick and these elephants were gorging themselves and he had gotten a twisted gut and it, and it killed him. So 
that was that was my lesson on this is when you have the opportunity go i mean i would have rather had that five minutes yes you know? so That's but the first uh, tip, i think everybody you take the opportunity when they come right yeah and uh, that'll we i'll after that you know we can segue into the to the rhinos and how all yeah. that came about and it was this lesson from tim and craig that got me to you know to to meet Najin and Fatu, the you know the last two northern white rhinos on the planet you know there's there's research they're trying to you know they've got embryos they're trying to save these but um but i'll, I'll bet you know i'm getting ahead but yeah we yeah the um yeah, Craig, I have now I've now seen Craig twice and, you know, went back and he was, they, you know, we hired the you know local Maasai and because they, they keep an eye on him. They help protect him and they usually know where he is. And we went back. It was a year later and he was almost in the exact same place where I saw him the first time. Isn't that wild? So, yeah, so, yeah, I yeah, got some got some great photos and yeah, and so hopefully be going back again soon and go and finding him again. I took a trip out to them um, and the Maasai came to us early in the morning. We were, we were out in tents and they woke everybody up because the elephants hadn't been around. They had wandered quite mm -hmm. far and they were coming through. It was early in the morning when they tend to move. And, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> and the funny thing is I said to them, yes, I'm aware because they actually came through our camp before the Maasai had known that they had done that. And one mm. of the elephants had been rubbing on my tent like it was. Yeah. Rough, <laughs> and I thought I was going to die because <laughs> yeah. they love to rub on the rocks. <laughs> like this is well, more, more people are killed by elephants and sharks every year. So <laughs> okay, did not know that. Yeah. So I was justified in my fear is what I'd like to say. Yeah. <laughs> So, so let's talk about the rhinos because this is all leading up everyone, you know, these photos, Heather's been popping in chat. I mean, they're stunning. I did think when I went and I know there's others that are have joined tonight who have traveled extensively in Africa. I remember when I was there taking photos and thinking, well, it's so beautiful here and the animals are right there. Like anyone can take beautiful photos, but then you see photos like yours and you're like, okay, maybe not that beautiful. But <laughs> um, before we transition, one of my questions for you, and it's actually something that someone wrote to us um, before this evening's event, how on earth do you pack? Because you're going to wild locales, you're using air transport where there's weight limits, like how, you know, and for budding photographers out there that maybe really do, like this is the trip of a lifetime, how do you pack and, and what are your tips for others about packing for these before we move on? Well, it, it depends on what I'm doing. If it's underwater, I'm it's let's, it, let's yeah, imagine it, we're above ground okay let, let's <laughs> let's go above ground well at Africa yeah at my underwater in Africa are two completely different things because underwater I've got my housing I've got my cameras I've got my lenses I've got you know I've got all that stuff you know the housing is bigger than my camera and it yeah that it's a it's a lot of gear but yeah Africa if you if you're taking all the you know like the safari link to get up to the different areas your your weight limit is 30 pounds total and i you know i've gotten lucky on the the times that i've been over there where it's you know wasn't a full flight i want to say full it's you know 16 i think 16 yeah, people it's pretty small yeah but if if it's not a full flight they're a little they're a little more lenient mm -hmm. but if it is full you know they're they're checking everything so you know we were you know, sticking things in, you know, our, our jackets <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Skipping breakfast, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, the, as far as, you know, camera gear goes, it's, you know, I, al I always travel with my laptop, especially on these trips when I'm gone for two weeks or more, because I don't want to come home to two weeks or five weeks of photos that I'm downloading all at one time. Yeah. I, you know, I'll shoot all day and then, you know, go into my, you know, go into my tent at night and start editing, you know, editing photos. And I've usually got a good chunk of them done before I even get back. But so, yeah, for like Africa, it's, it's my laptop, my chargers. It's, I, I take, I take two bodies because it's inevitable, you know, that it's, especially in Africa, it's all the dust and the dirt and they're going to get those bogged. roads. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, two lenses that's um and that's it 
that's that's it yeah it's um you know there there have been times where i wish i had others you know to, sure. to create you know get it you know experiment with but sure. yeah you know, just you you've only got so much room and so much weight to take so it it, it and it's got you know it's it's kind of fun too in that regard you know it's a challenge it's like what you know what can i do with just these two lenses so yeah, sure. when you yeah. say when you shoot for a day how many photos are we talking like how click happy are you <laughs> I like, you know, we, you know, like we were talking about earlier, it's, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, super click happy. I, I do, I do compose. Um, you know, like I said, I, I've seen a lot of photographers just go out and they're just, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. doing this with it. There's just, there's no art to that. No. You know, it's, uh, but on, you know, an average day in Africa, I'll probably shoot. I mean, it's, it's under a thousand. Okay. but it's you know in you know there's there's some days where i mean i've had days where i've only shot 50 photos wow. you know it just and you know of course after you've done it for a while you get much more selective you know the first time it's i'm i'm shooting every elephant there is because uh, there's no <laughs> there's no there's a so but then after you've been there and done it and experienced it you start really getting an idea you know specific shots that you want and you look for those you seek them out and create them and instead of just you know shooting everything that walks in front of you so yeah i've i've had 50 shoot days and i've had you know i've, I've had a couple 2000 photo shoot days but you know those are not that often so on, on average probably four or five hundred photos that's a lot of photos. That's 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 yeah. good perspective for folks. Um, yeah. but it's not as well, much. Yeah, you know, com compared to to twenty four. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That you're confined with, and I mean, I see people post, you know, albums on Facebook or somewhere just on a family vacation, and they do that many in a day of of non, uh, you know, of just life. So uh, mm -hmm. nothing posed. So let's mm -hmm. talk. So you missed you missed your chance with Tim. You're back in the states, and you're planning your next trip elephants are still on your mind but somehow rhinos enter the equation let's talk about that yeah the the first trip that we went on we didn't see any rhinos we saw two from literally about a mile away you know i, I had i had my camera zoomed in with the multiplier in crop mode and it was still just a little dot on the screen. <laughs> so but um yeah so I going going back I wanted you know I wanted to experience that and again I don't remember exactly or you know where I ran across these but there's there's a, another photographer we're friends on Instagram but we've never we've never met but we follow each other's work and he had posted something about the old Pajetic Conservancy in Kenya where it's um their main thing is the black rhinos they've got i think they've got one of the largest black rhino um, populations in in africa and but they've also got the two last northern white rhinos it's Najin and fatu their mother and daughter and this guy that had done this i messaged him and I said you know can you give me any advice you know where to go you know how do i do this you know do you have any guides that you'd recommend? And he told me nothing about this guy, but his his name is his name was James Moenda, and actually it's I don't it, Moenda is actually his his African name, but you know they take on um, you know Western names, I guess. And so he's he's always gone by James, but you know we we call him Moenda. But he. Um, he was the caretaker for Najin. He was a ranger over there. And he was a caretaker for Najin and Fatu. And he was also the caretaker for Sudan. That was the last male white rhino that passed away in 2018. And he, he did that for seven years, I think, and finally had to step away because it's so emotionally draining. You know, he, when, when he started, I think he said there were um i forget the number i mean it's only a handful you know like five six seven rhinos the you know the northern whites and on his watch 
there were a couple that were poached yeah. and you know they were had checked on them and they left and were going back you know going back to camp or whatever and then they heard the gun go off and they knew instantly what it was but so he's you know he's now a, a guide over there and he still works with Najin and Fatu. And so this is who this is who this guy recommended for me. And we have now since become great friends. And in fact, I'm supposed to, I was supposed to call him today, but uh, he, yeah, he's he's the one that took us to meet them and told us the whole story. And I, I again, it was you know, it's like the the big Tuskers. You know, there's only a couple dozen of them left. I had no idea that there were only two of these rhinos. And I think most people, because I was one of them, you just you know, it's a rhino. You know, it's oh, it's a black rhino, it's a northern white rhino, it's a southern white rhino. You know, it just it doesn't register if you're not there and part of them and experiencing them personally. And but when you go and meet them, and I and I, I don't know what photos I can't see the screen, but you know, there's a there's a photo of, of me, you know, with them because. And they, these, these two were actually in, they were in a zoo and I, I forget what country it was, but they, in, in a, in hopes of saving this species, they, they flew them back to Kenya and they created this conservancy specifically for them. And it was, they were hoping that they would breed and it, it didn't, it didn't work, but they, you know, they have collected, um, I think, I think now, I think they said now they've got up to 17 embryos that they say that they've created because they were, you know, collecting the, the sperm from the males and then the, the eggs from the, the two females and the mother, they last year, find they had to quit she just couldn't do it anymore so now it's just this is it. it's just the daughter yeah that is that's still producing the eggs so they're still they're still trying to create these embryos and the um what they're what they're doing is you know these are the northern whites and with their southern whites there and they they've already located or you know chosen these southern whites that they they want to use as surrogates mm -hmm. so they're creating southern white embryos and impregnating the the southerns to see if it works and so far they haven't had any luck but when they're successful with that then they'll start using these northern white embryos and you know see if see if they can continue this you know, to, to, you know, to, to save, to save these rhinos, this but yeah, you know, yeah. The point of all that was, yeah, the, you know, the, it was, it was kind of, it was the same, like we were saying a minute ago, it was the same thing with, you know, with the, uh, you know, with Tim and Craig. In fact, this buddy of mine that he went on that trip with me too, and we had already planned our other trip and everything was scheduled. We had all, everything lined up and I discovered this and I said, we've got to reroute this trip we've got like, to go see you're not yeah, the planner but you get to you get to turn the trip upside down because you're the photographer it, it, and and i did and i'm so <laughs> glad i did but it yeah he he said well you know we've already got this planned you know let's you know let's do it next time and i was like well you remember tim <laughs> it, remember there, there tim might be next time your photographer yeah. so, but but i but i have i have had the opportunity to, to see them twice now too so but I think too, so I think this is this is a great story to share because it's changed your trajectory as a photographer, right? So so these experiences in Africa and yeah. how things have responded to your photos has has fundamentally changed where you're going professionally, right? We've had interesting yeah. conversations about that. Yeah, it was um yeah, you know, like I said, you know, I when I first started doing this seriously you know it was it was just you know i was just shooting because i was having fun and then it you know the the music thing i i just i had, i've done it for 20 years now and i was just looking for something different and that's you know how i got back into underwater and in africa and then when i would post a photo and tell my story 
you know, like I'm doing with you guys now, you know, started on just, you know, the socials of Facebook and Instagram and posting these pictures and telling my experience and people were really resonating with it and asking questions. And, you know, some people are like, Oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm never eating, you know, whatever again, or, you know, cause I, you know, the, it's like, there was, I, um, it was tiger beach. It was the tiger sharks in the Bahamas and it's all open water and where, you know, the, the tiger shark, you know, they'll come in and swim around. And I, there was this grouper. He was about, you know, so big, you know, two feet, three feet. And he would swim around and he, he wouldn't come right up to me. And a lot of times groupers can be pretty friendly and you can pet Mm -hmm. them. But this guy was, he just, he circled me, but he wouldn't come in. But as soon as the tiger sharks came in, he would swim up and hide between my legs. <laughs> and I and I told the story, and people were like, "Oh my God, I'm never eating grouper again." You know, it's just it's given. <laughs> you know, they're, you know, it's I guess it's you know putting these human elements on these animals, but it's well, he did put but you it was in that, front of the shark, so <laughs> he might have had yeah. some animosity towards that grouper in particular, right? So, but, uh, but yeah, it was just, um, it was those little moments that I started to see that my photography was so much more than just taking a cool picture that hoping somebody would buy it and hang it on the wall. You know, it's just, it's really bringing awareness and, you know, getting people to care. And I realized that there's, you know, there's, you know, I still get the haters and, you know, the hunters that are, you know, if I post something about it, you know, they, they come in defending their reasons why they should be able to go and, you know, kill an elephant. But, you know, I imagine that's especially true in the state of Texas, because I've been in a number of homes with a fair amount of taxidermy on the walls. So Mm. I imagine uh, you're, you're in a hot pot here in Texas. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So, Ronnie, before we move into what's next, there is there is a great lesson that I saw through your Instagram profile this summer of being adaptable. It was about your trip to France to shoot the horses. And can you talk a little bit about that trip and that great photo that came out of it that you talked about? Yeah, I've France is is one of my I I, I love this trip. And it was a, a friend of mine his name was Jonathan Bird. He wrote a song called Wild Ponies and it was about the the horses on the Outer Banks in North Carolina. And he was like, you need to come photograph these horses. So I'm researching them. And I somehow these horses in France and the Camargue, they're down on the Mediterranean and it's all marshland. And these, it's uh, it's, it's one of the oldest breed of horses in the world. They're indigenous to the area they're they're smaller horses they're like 14 hands big hooves to help them you know get through all the mud and the muck and so all those iconic photos you see of these white horses running through the water this was the place and I was like I've I've got to go do this and I called Jonathan and I said you know sorry uh, you know, <laughs> I discovered I discovered France I said we'll we'll do this later and I think it's six years later, I still haven't been to North Carolina because <laughs> I keep going. I'm going to send them this video as a reminder. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it was, uh, but yeah, it's, it's become one of my favorite places. I just, I love this trip. I love the horses. I mean, I've, I've, I feel like I've literally made a connection with these horses, you know, like they remember me and it's, um, but the, this last trip, it was the before right before COVID. It, it was my very first trip that got canceled. I think I was about a week away from going, and everything got shut down. And then it was one of my first trips back when we were able to to travel again. But I got over there, and there are several factors. It was you know global warming has really affected the the water levels over there there because a lot of when when you look at these photos when you like some of the ponds they're just they're they're only you know at max at max knee deep yeah and some some of them as far as you can see it's all water but it's you know it's that deep the whole way across so 
any kind of you know change in water patterns it's going to be drastic so there were ponds some of my favorite locations were complete just bone dry so my guide that lives over there he's having to get creative and find other areas to go to go and shoot and on top of that you know the government is restricted because a lot of them are not a lot but some you know some of the places were on just public land and the government has restricted access to some of those spots and is it for conservation it, it, or why is it restricted is it conservation? Who, who, who knows oh. you know it's um yeah it's politics you know <laughs> it's just sure. but um you know the the others are on on these private ranches but these you know the some of these areas are yeah they're just they're so dry so he was having to find other ranches that still had water on them and we we got it in fact it was the last day the last shoot we went out to this swamp area and i'm just going <laughs> oh this is awful I was, it's just I, I almost didn't even want to shoot because it's like i'm not going to get anything here it wasn't you know that i it's like we were talking about africa you know you, yeah. after you've done it you start getting these ideas in your head and you you're trying to create those but I, I had to completely change my tone and just let all that go. And it's like, well, this is the last shoot. Let's just see what I can do. But it was in the, cause I like, you know, I just, I love big open areas. I, I don't want any distraction. If, wait, that's why I love the big animals. I just, you know, I want a whale or a shark or a lion or an elephant and I don't want anything else in the shot. Yeah. And, but we get there on, and this is just, it's just all tree lined and it just it's dark and i it just it would just wasn't what i wanted what i expected you know i i'd never even shot a place like this over there <laughs> it was completely different and so but i and like my portrait work i i love to get dark and moody and get mm -hmm. creative with my light and black out my backdrops so with these trees and the white horses, I was able to create that. And the light was, it was that late afternoon light. And these horses, I mean, they're running, you know, feet in front of you. And I, yeah, I just, I, I ended up getting one of my all time favorite shots because of that contrast, you know, the, the white horse with the black background, I was able to, you know, meter it to completely black out the back and you know the splashing water and it was it was completely different than anything i'd ever shot over there before you're shooting in the wild you have to be adaptable period and yeah out of it you might get your favorite shot <laughs> yes another yeah. great tip for photography hey, well you know and it, it, it's my my two of my favorite shots over there were both on you know what started out as crappy shoots <laughs> you know it's and you just never know so you, yeah I, I i try and tell myself to, you know go in not you know go in with that kind of a you know you know thought process i guess but it was it was in fact it was the last the last shoot before covid it was the same thing it was the last shoot of the last day the weather was just awful raining cold windy and not that i would you know not go shoot but there's that in your head you're going oh sure oh i don't want to go out in this <laughs> Rain check. But I ended up getting one of my favorite shots because it, you know, because of the wind and the, the horses are, you know, chest deep water and they're, they're creating this swell with the water and the wind, the manes are just going all over the place and showing um, up the musicians and their faux fans blowing wind at them. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ronnie, you know, we brought everyone through a lot of these stories because what's really great about your work is you do have galleries, you do show all around Texas and elsewhere, and, and it's really cool to be get to get the story behind the photo. So you bring the photo home, you bring the story with it. But more than that, I wanted people to meet you and to hear where you're going next, because for a lot of folks, you know, it is far off, as you said, right? It's mm. it's elephants. I see them at the zoo, but like seeing them in the wild, the first time I saw a giraffe in the wild, it might have well has been a dinosaur. You know, it was, right. it was <laughs> unreal about that. Um, but I want people to hear about where you're going next because I think that through this work 
it ties us all together beautifully because all of us who enjoy travel, enjoy photography and art, I think can um, take joy in where you're going next. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about the the next? Yeah, it's uh, leave, actually leave October 25th and we're going to French Polynesia, uh, you know, Tahiti. It's, um, there's several islands over there and it's same thing. A buddy of mine actually planned this. It, to be honest, I don't know exactly where we're going. I know Fakarava is one of them, but um, I don't know I know there's whales and sharks and that's all I needed to know. So it's, uh, it's, it's beautiful over there. And in fact, there's, there's one area. It's just, it's just, it's like a wall of sharks. You get in the water and it just, they just keep coming. They just, it just never ends. So, so how do you yeah, we're going to go do Everybody? that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering, how do you stay alive in the water with all these sharks? That, you know, it's just, well, sharks, sharks are, you know, very, you know, they, they've gotten a bad rap. It's, um, they're, they're one of the most misunderstood species. They're not, they're not as aggressive as, you know, they're made out to be, you know, with, you know, these movies and, mm -hmm. you know, Jaws, Jaws started it obviously. But, Jaws fall. okay. Yeah. But, you know, there's, there's on average, there's only about 10 people killed a year yeah. worldwide yeah, by crazy. sharks. And, and it's always mistaken identity. Yeah. And of course they don't have a hand to touch and see, you know, what, what, what are, are you? <laughs> so the only way they do that is with their mouth. And that's why most people that do get, and you know, I don't like saying attacks because it's not an attack. You know, it's that, you know, people that get bit by a shark, they survive because as soon as a shark bites, they're just like, oh, this isn't what I want. And they spit you out and they move on there. Yes, there are occasions where you know, in fact, a buddy of mine, he was a surfer. He, he had a tiger shark that took his leg and, and now he's, he's one of the biggest shark advocates around, but, um, so yeah, it just, it just, it's just not a, you know, they're just not as, you know, awful as they're, they're made out to be. I mean, we humans, we kill literally over a hundred million sharks a year. I mean, to wrap your brain around that one. 100 million sharks and we you know it just we we need them you know i i call them the trash compactors of the ocean you know they they clean up there are the vultures of the ocean you know they're they're cleaning up the sick and the dead and the dying you know it's like when you see these whales that are offshore that have been you know that are yeah. dead and they're you know they'll swarm and eat those and clean it you know they just they keep the oceans clean and they keep the oceans in balance and you know we lose them we're gonna we're gonna lose our oceans so conservancy so it, is your new theme wouldn't you say conservancy uh, yeah. is where you're going with yeah. this and the sharks are part of that the rhinos are part of that the elephants are part of that mm -hmm. what how will you be doing your conservancy work um going forward well my girlfriend and i have started a we're still in the in the the beginning phases um trying to get it you know the legalities of it all but we're we're working on starting a you know a conservation group and instead of you know reinventing the wheel and starting our own group to you know for our purposes we're just we want to we want to raise money and each year we want to you know vet and find different organizations that we want to sponsor and donate to them because they've already got the, they've already got the you know yes. the boots on the ground they're already doing it so and it's you know the that the old Pajeta conservancy where the you know Najin and Fatu are we did an event and that's kind of what I think launched this is you know we it was a last minute kind of thing we just you know threw this together and uh, we raised what. 20 2500 bucks you know just for, just here in Wimberley and you know Hi, with that we, you know, <laughs> yeah and yeah and from that you know we we donated all that money to to old Pajetta and we got to adopt a baby rhino over there that we you know 
named Wimber Lake. So, <laughs> and we, and I do, do we have that photo up there? I don't know if I posted that one yet, but um, yeah, we, the last time we went over, we went back to Old Vegeta and the, the Rangers helped us track him down and got to, you know, meet him you know, as, as best as you can meet a wild rhino yeah i was gonna say i can't really cuddle <laughs> yeah. yeah that's extraordinary so, but yeah that's 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 where yeah that's where it's where it's going and and you know there's just every everything needs help you know it just you know the the numbers on elephants and giraffes and you know even hyenas as much as i hate those things you know, <laughs> they're they're important you know we need them and they they serve a purpose you know just but all these all these animals are you know endangered and it's like i said it's it's whether it's poaching or you know human wildlife conflict and like especially right now in fact anybody that's watching that you know wants to help out the, the any any of these conservancies over there um could use because they're they're in a severe severe drought right now and so of course these elephants are they're coming into farms and raiding farms and of course you know that's i i, I get it it yeah, sucks but I get what it. they have yeah they you know they'll come in and they can destroy an entire crop overnight yeah. so they're you know they're running these elephants off and unfortunately some of them are you know throwing killed. poison spears at them and it, you know yeah. they're in and up, ends up killing them and so there you know there's groups over there that are trying to you know either you know bring in money or bring in uh, you know bring in water or bring in hay or you know just anything they can you know to survive this thing but yeah. it just it's gotten it's gotten really bad and if you have a list of conservancies that are on your, you know, that are on your radar, we'd love to be able to share them after, um, after tonight, when we send okay. that email, we can yeah. share those. I think it's important. And obviously we meant, we mentioned James in the article and we'll make sure we reshare that article as well so that people have that. Um, there's a few questions that have come in on chat. Uh, let's hit one of them quickly. Uh, do you have an all time, all time, favorite photo you've taken or top three you've mentioned the horses of course is in the top but do you have a top or do you have a top three? Oh man that's so hard i yeah i do have <laughs> i've got so many photos that resonate for different reasons um you know i i love the i love the photo of craig um the you know, my, my great white photos. Um, and then I, that my, my humpback, the humpback whale, the one it's, it's the photo, it's actually upside down. That was a photo that it won grand prize in scuba diving magazines, photography contest. And, uh. but it was just, it was this humpback. It was on the surface. And it was it was a cool photo, but when I'm editing this and I'm looking at it, and it's like it just it's missing something. I can't figure out what it is. So all I did was turn it upside down, so it looks like the whale is breaching out <laughs> of the water, and you know the it. So and and it and it's funny because you know half the people see it right away, and the other half, you know, it's like they're you know doing this <laughs> looking upside down, trying to to comprehend and. I don't have but, it in yeah, front of me. Where did you shoot that one? That was in Tonga. Okay. In the you know, South Pacific, you know, near near Fiji. But um, yeah, that I mean the yeah, the the horses, like I said, or as much as I love Africa and as much as I love my underwater stuff, I, I just I love my horse photos. It's just it's just so much fun. I just you know the the especially when you've got the, you know, a, a herd of them just stampeding straight for you and <laughs> water going everywhere. And it's just, yeah, just, it's just such a rush. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Another question. Have you ever done any photo shoots in very cold climates, penguins, Arctic animals? If not, will you be? Yes, I will be. Um, but I hate the cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why you love Texas. Okay, we got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, 
Yeah, some some of my most desirable subjects, I guess, that I haven't done yet because I'm trying to build up the nerve, I guess. But when, when and one of I, my one of my main was I want to go do the orcas in Norway, but there is there's a small pod that had been hanging out in the Sea of Cortez down in Mexico, and I just got to go do that a few months ago, and that yeah that but and and you know because when i heard that i was like oh good now i don't have, i don't have to go to norway yeah i was gonna say but, that's cheating <laughs> well but this but this pod it was it was five females i think i think they said that there's five different pods over there and every once in a while they'll all get together but it's not very common and when they do it's like 50 but we yeah we had five and but then in norway they uh, the time of year it's like November to January, I think. And you got about literally two hours of light because it's so far up North, you know, yeah. it's just, so you've got a very narrow window, but it's obviously miserably, miserably cold. You know, you go in with a dry suit with heaters and I've seen you know videos, people still coming out just with blue lips and just like, Oh my God, that was so amazing. <laughs> 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 but but the orcas there you i mean there's there's thousands of them there's like two thousand orcas and and you know humpback whales and so these herring are coming in and they're all feeding and you can get a photo with five humpbacks and a hundred orcas in one in one picture so yeah i've still i've still got to go do that i i do want to do antarctica and you know do the the sea leopards um, it also sounds like a lot of I, new equipment rodney so that your camera doesn't freeze i don't know it doesn't sound healthy for the equipment uh, I'm, I'm more worried about me but <laughs> <laughs> no nah, that's what we got uh, cold weather clothes for rodney i think thank you so much for kind of running at the top of the hour here we can't wait to see where your work goes next we'd love to be able to follow along uh rodney's on instagram we put his site into the chat if you are so inclined check it out uh we also put his artifacts uh link there where you can see it and obviously if you're here in texas you can can come meet him in, in living flesh if he's on the ground but we, we really yeah. are excited to see where you're going next with all your conservancy work thank you oh, thank so you. much for joining us thank you so much it was fun it thank was you, okay. everyone else so we thank you for joining us and next week we're going to stick on the photos theme but we'll have brooke lake joining us she's a professional archivist and she's going to talk about how to take care of those photos and documents at home and she's going to talk about how artifacts is actually shaking things up in the archival industry. So we hope you'll join us. Thank you, everyone, and good night. <laughs>